Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, there's always a difficulty in pronouncing my name. Um, some people from the internet community, as of last year, started calling me just Lisa A, so feel free to refer to me as Lisa A, which is fine. So today's presentation I have for you is um, just in line with pretty much the down market that we are finding ourselves in. It's, um, it's amazing that I hear that the last year's conference actually gathered amazing crowds. And uh, this year's conference is still amazing, but there are just a little bit fewer people here. Well, obviously, uh, the markets have changed. Uh, the tide has gone, at, and, and you know we see the ramifications of perhaps a little bit less interest in the subject matter. And yet, um, I'd like to stress that this is actually an amazing revolutionary time that we're living in. And uh, mark these words, those of you who are still here, those of you who are um, looking for some answers, building companies, building projects, you will be probably the ones um, going into the future, uh, explaining how this all works uh, to our children and grandchildren. So this is an amazing time we're living in. Speaking of utility or security, um, it's definitely not binary. And uh, let me start by saying that we are talking about capital markets. We are talking about companies, uh, people, projects, raising funding. So this is the realm of capital funding. The capital markets um, originally consisted of four pillars. Uh, it was either private equity, venture capital, initial public offering, which was for already mature companies, or uh, private or public debt. So there's always a surplus uh, capital looking to get into the hands of those who need it. And typically those are companies, startups, uh, even governments. Now, this is actually in itself uh, historically been either equity or, uh, or um, or debt, uh, private equity is uh, obviously equity, venture capital is either debt or equity, uh, initial public offering is uh, equity, and uh, so on. Now, when we are in the realm of um, utility tokens, it's actually neither. It's, uh, it's more like a service or a promise of a service or a product. And it didn't come as a complete innovation. It actually uh, has made a full circle. So let's look at these four uh, very interesting pit stops in the, in the history of, of uh, capital markets. So securities, uh, the, they've been around for a really long time. Uh, even in the ancient Roman Republic, we used to have companies traded amongst uh, shareholders. Uh, then one of the most notable uh, subjects to mention is uh, the U.S. Securities Act in 1933. Then there, each and every uh, country, of course, had their laws. And uh, in Europe, when that formed, there is this uh, unified EU directive, uh, which is called 2003-71 EC Rules on Prospectus. This is securities realm. And then sometime... Also, in the ancient history, we also have something called the crowdfunding. Um, to me, that's like the, the, the sea voyage partnerships, which uh, used to be in the, in the age of um, discovery, the only speculative instrument around. Uh, back in today, in modern history, we have Kickstarter, which pretty much kickstarted the whole uh, crowdfunding uh, fashion. So only after Kickstarter, if, and this is, I'm not a lawyer, this is a full disclosure, but if, not, if I'm not correct, if I am correct, then Kickstarter actually started the whole um, legal grounds for uh, uh, crowdfunding platforms. And finally, in 2012, there was actually a, um, an American law within the Jobs Act that uh, uh, came out as an exemption uh, for, for crowdfunding uh, platforms to, to actually exist. Now, in Europe, however, there is no one unified law um, on crowdfunding yet. However, 
And Estonia is actually one very big and uh, good example. I'll talk about that later. Uh, which proves that uh, national uh, jurisdictions are very successfully uh, capable of implementing crowdfunding law. Now, remember I said that uh, ICOs and utility tokens are not actually that unique. They truly are a simple leap uh, from the crowdfunding idea into ICO uh, or utility tokens or the services. Uh, for companies wary of these security laws, pretty much doing the same thing that the crowdfunding was doing. I don't know if any of you have any experience with crowdfunding, but I actually remember when I was pre-buying, um, what was it, a Kano computer from Kickstarter, the American company. And it was, it was a big question I was asking myself, okay, I'm gonna pay now these 100 euros or 100 dollars, what am I gonna get back? Am I gonna get something back at all? And that's exactly the same what happened with the ICOs. It's precisely the same idea. We are pre-buying, pre-paying for something that might actually not happen. And yet, at the same time, this has sparked an enormous, an enormous revolution in, in, in you know, great ideas to be actually built in the first place. So now, the, the other binary option of uh, security, the so-called STO. But there are no actual laws as of today. We still don't have, uh, you know, pretty much uh, unified laws uh, today. And, but we, we do have uh, laws for securities per se, where you pay for securities in fiat. But we don't actually have laws for securities to be paid in, in crypto. Now, there is regulatory scrutiny on the rise, and uh, some countries like Switzerland and Malta have introduced detailed token classification and tests to determine the token category. Whereas most countries, such as our own, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, we have more like uh, guidelines uh, that that pretty much uh, guides us towards um, the requirement you may have to register a security if it exhibits any sort of uh, any sort of security-like type of uh, features. So there are three, uh, pretty much three, pioneering jurisdictions: the Swiss Finma, which came out with the guidelines very early at the end, at the beginning of this year. Then there's Malta, which came into action, into force this November. And in Gibraltar, we still don't have clear regulation on, on, on token um, classification, regulation, permissions, trading, um, correction. We do have something on trading, and that's the DLT service provide licensing, which came into force uh, this January. Now, actually, based on those, um, Based on those, maybe you didn't catch, and there are actually three uh, categories for, for virtual tokens. And uh, to sum them up, we pretty much have either utility, security, or uh, hybrid. Now, I'd like you to look at this um, third option, which, which in a way says, okay, obviously they can be binary, there's something always in between, uh, Utility in itself is, uh, is just uh, a pretense. Uh, security is security, we have laws for that. And hybrid is something that is maybe innovative, maybe not. Let's see how it pans out. Anyway, uh, let's start from the beginning. So utility. Uh, has anyone heard of that uh, research where utility tokens are claimed to be like the 85% scam? Probably quite a few of them. Well, there is one research which, been, uh, which has been um, uh, quoted quite a lot. I have quoted it. Uh, but in true reality, that, um, those parameters, those criteria that were taken into account in, in, in making these utility tokens uh, to, to sound like scams were uh, false in, 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 their, in their foundation. For instance, one of them, if the utility token was not listed or traded on any exchange, for some reason, that was considered a scam. If it lost some sort of market value, 
the project was considered a scam. So it's interesting to look at these um, findings, but I would rather say, even if they were true, even if they were true, uh, venture capital and IPO companies actually fail in nine out of 10 cases as well. So even if the utility tokens all in total were scams and failures, in fact, the legacy funding industry shows us a, a huge amount of failure rate, just as much. So typically, um, utility is registered on blockchain, obviously. This vast majority of it's uh, registered on the Ethereum blockchain. It's anonymous, it's, uh, it, it can be uh, traded anonymously. Recently, there has been enforcement on the AML KYC uh, uh, regulation and, and uh, this sort of a compliance has been well regarded as of late. Well, they're freely transferable. Uh, with regards to securities, now, we do have laws for securities, and if we were to s apply these securities laws onto the, uh, onto the token issuances or the STOs, we would really need to take into account the fact that these securities cannot be freely transferable. So this technological feat is yet to be seen how it's going to be accomplished. I have personally tried to participate in some security sales, and I can tell you for a fact, it's not solved. Although our IT team is uh, quite uh, positive on how to do this, the actual existing products out there, which I've been looking into, they haven't. So that's still something we need to work on. And obviously the innovation, and I'd say pretty much the only innovation in securities uh, for, for tokens, is the fact that they will be registered on a blockchain. They will be living on a blockchain, so obviously also, depository receipts will be living on a blockchain. But then someone would still need to manage that. There will still need to be a central counterparty registering the AML profiles, um, ensuring the exchange is done between uh, AML cleared uh, persons. Now, there's also a third uh, or hybrid uh, sort of token asset. And uh, I'd say those are stable coins or, or other payment coins, which, um, which obviously are also registered on the blockchain, but which absolutely must be centrally registered, audited, and acknowledged, and at the same time, freely transferable, unlike security tokens. And now these are probably the most interesting cases because there we don't really, we can't really say, okay, they have failed, or there is one example which failed in what? 90%, sorry, it went below the value of um, a par for what, 10 cents or 15 cents? So it, it wasn't 100% uh, success in that sense. But otherwise, uh, the only way that a stable coin can fail if there's a theft of the reserves or if the auditor is making false claims or other such centrally governed if event basically happens. So therefore, these hybrid tokens are probably the closest, uh, in my view, are the closest crypto asset which has a, um, a potential to actually show some sort of a uh, quick development. But then again, well, what was actually the mission of the utility, with the utility token, the good old ICO utility token? It was very, very simple. And I love that mission. It was to avoid, uh, I'll just read it off. It was to avoid suffocating red tape in publicly raising funds for early stage projects, pre-selling their services, and all of that in cryptocurrencies. It was just a new way of doing the, the good old thing, just getting kick-started our projects. It was great. And there are several things that came out of it uh, which were great. Just as Kickstarter uh, allowed me to pre-buy something that typically I'd have to wait and probably pay double as much on a shop or shelf, it basically democratized access uh, for me as a non-professional, non-accredited investor to not just pre-buy or pre-sell a product, to actually pre-buy a 
participation in a company. It's a non-discriminatory availability of investment options, as long as you have the internet and as long as you know how to manage an Ethereum wallet. Great. So startups, as actually uh, my own, or established companies, were able to do so without too much red tape, which is fantastic, because founders should be concentrating on their business. So this is also, and this is a fair point, it actually created a marketing tool for these companies to, to, to expand and get traction and, and, and grow the community. And it was very true in, in, in my own case. Now, of course, there were also fraud, scam cases. I have heard of some of them. Uh, you know, when you, when you take money to do one thing and you actually do something else, that's fraud. Uh, or if you take the money and you run, that's fraud and embezzlement. And uh, we have laws to fight that. We already have laws to fight that. Now, obviously, you're starting to, to feel where I'm going to, is, is laws and, 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 and legal um, uh, uh, restrictions. And still, uh, you know, despite all the fraud, possibly 85% failure, which is still a question whether it's true or not. In fact, it's probably too early to judge because companies take five to seven years to actually develop. So let's talk about fraud or, or, or failure maybe in 10 years. So non-binding support for by contribution, pre-selling a future service offer, uh, not dissimilar to already mentioned crowdfunding, is actually a good thing. Just a quick reminder, it's an amazing time we're living in. It's a 10-year-old idea, and it brought us an alternative monetary system, and this is undoubted. Of course, right now we have so many monetary systems, it's really hard to choose one. And that's fine. That's called free market. Yeah, let them live. Let them show what they can do. Let the communities behind them show what they can develop. It's an opportunity for wider financial inclusion. And I don't have to tell you this. We are here in Europe privileged. We are privileged with banking systems that we have. I don't think there's anyone in this room that doesn't have a bank account. But we know very well that these privileges do not apply for everyone. There are so many people who are simply underbanked, let alone uh, have an opportunity to, to take a loan or build a business. It's an expansion of global financial system in a, in a much wider sense. It's a modification of capital flow. It's money record keeping and money being one of the records. Uh, and and it, it goes far beyond capital markets. So it's almost like if this new currency or monetary system is building for itself a completely new infrastructure. And in order to do that, uh, we as law-abiding citizens, we also need to voice our fears, voice our, our, our wishes, and this would be mine. Uh, Milton Friedman, a wonderful economist and the Nobel uh, Prize laureate, said once, the government in pursuit of good intentions tries to rearrange the economy, legislate morality, or help special interest. The cost often is inefficiency, lack of motivation, and loss of freedom. So I'd like to leave you with this idea, and uh, hopefully some regulatory uh, interest also hear me, that it's absolutely crucial that we do not over-regulate, and if the securities laws do come about, I, I only hope, and it's my only hope, that they come about with an acceptance of this idea of innovation. And until today, the innovation has been pretty much in crowdfunding, in utility tokens. It doesn't need to be binary. It's not actually binary. There are many grays in the middle. We just need to define them, and we need to let them live. Thank you very much.